Welcome to World Rowing's Coastal Race Module Keynote Series. In this session, we're going to be looking at safety management. It's part of the safety series, and this session is called pre-launch. It's the activities that you'll do prior to going afloat. My name's Gwyn Batten. I'm a former Olympic silver medalist and coastal world champion, and it's great that you're on board. So let's get going. In this session, we're going to be looking at the practical tasks that a coach will do just before their just before their boat goes onto the water. A dynamic risk assessment, safety checks, crew briefing, signing out systems, and taking the boat to the water. If we reflect back on our first session on safety session in this series, we talked about the steps, the four phases, stages of managing an on-water session, planning, pre-launch, on-water, post-landing. And in this, we are going to look in detail at the five steps that come under the pre-launching. And if I just remind ourselves why we do these steps, we're really, it's an opportunity for you as the coach to modify the plan with any last minute changes, whether it's weather, um, changes of boats, um, changes of athletes. Okay, so it's a real opportunity that for you to make that. It's an opportunity to make sure the boat and the crew have everything you need to have them to have based on the conditions and the assessment that you've made. It helps everyone know the plan and what to do if things go wrong. It helps you in the position where you can let make sure that the people on shore know your float plan and they have enough details to send out a rescue services if something goes wrong gives you an opportunity to remind people about good lifting to avoid injury and above all it's just good practice for good coaches. So let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about dynamic risk assessment. So just to remind mind you that dynamic risk assessment is part of the duty of care for your rowers. It comes under the whole risk management um, that your club, your national federation and your um, you as a coach through your coach education will have learnt about. And where it differs from other types of risk assessments, this is the real time assessment of the risk based on the actual conditions in front of you as a coach. And because of that, in many cases, the dynamic risk assessment isn't written down. We are going to share with you some examples where they have been written down, but this is mainly through the to help you being educated in terms of building your skills. So, in essence, the dynamic risk assessment assists risk assessment you make and from that you determine what additional actions and controls need to take place. So if after your assessment you feel that the risk remains low and there's no extra controls required beyond the generic risk assessment that systems that you have in place linked to your club or to your squad setting, you proceed as normal with caution and of course we always as coaches always proceed with caution. If you perceive that the risk is starting to mount and is medium it's an opportunity for you to take action with extra controls needed but you then do continue with your session. Now it might be a modification or it might be some additional, um, additional support or it might be um, avoiding certain areas etc. So what potentially those additional controls might be. And then of course, if you feel after during your dynamic risk assessment that the risks are too are high, you will stop the activity until the hazards the, the hazards are reduced. So for example, if you are under if you are afloat while you are making your dynamic risk assessments, you would proceed, you'd stop the outing and you would proceed to your nearest shelter or whatever the easiest way to get the boat off the water is. If if through your dynamic risk assessment, you decided that the um, risk was too high before you went out, you would not go afloat. So let's have a little look um, at what things you might consider um, for um, a dynamic risk assessment as far as coastal rowing is concerned. And you can see here, we've developed a checklist um, and this is available in the coach's toolkit um, as you do your qualification or you do your um, module. But you can see here on the left hand side, there is a range of hazards and on the right hand side, there's a range of potential controls. So 
Um, it's an opportunity for you just to um, check that you're not missing anything in your dynamic risk assessment and you yourselves at your club, um, you may want to bespoke and make one, make a checklist for yourself that includes all the elements that are relevant to your bit of water. So you can see on the on the left hand side of this checklist here, we've got the lists of the hazards. So what is the water state? What is the and this is um, looking at the water itself, the surface of the water, the movement of the water, so you swell, the water quality, water direction, wind strength and how that's affected. Remember, we talked about wind over tide, potential depth of that water, um, the tidal current. And of course, there may be some other features unique to your um, area. It might even just be um, the, the temperature um, of the water. Now, wave break. Um, this is particularly if you're um, coming on and off a beach or if you are doing um, beach sprint practice. OK, and looking at the wave type, the break height, the wave frequency, the shape of the beach, risk of bow piercing. So upending. And we'll talk more about that as we, we talk about surfing, rip currents and other such stuff. Beach state. So what is the actual land part of the beach like? So what's the beach condition like, the slope of the beach, headlands, groins, seaweed, debris, rocks, sand, you know, you might have weaver fish, you know, so there's a lot of things that may be in and around that, that area. It may also may have a lot of um, pollution, there may be foam um, up on the beach, so really looking at those sort of conditions. Then we've got another section here, which is just a general one about weather conditions. I've put wind speed in again, again here on this one. Um, visibility, available light, sun exposure, um, heat, cold, hypothermia. So a little bit of, of a cap, catch all in there. And then we've got some other risk factors, marine traffic, um, number of other rowing boats, um, length of the planned session. If you're, you, you're going out for a long distance, distance from shore or, the, or distance from the nearest shelter. And sometimes they're a little bit different. Age, health and fitness of your rowers. So then if we go across onto the control side, you're looking at some of these controls in around the rowing boat themselves. So whether or not the boat is in good condition, your athletes got suitable clothing, they're wearing life jackets or have life jackets with them. Um, you know, does the boat have additional flotation inside it if you're going particularly far offshore? Um, do you have um, drinks and snacks? Is there personal, you know, is there a GPS on board um, or is a personal locator device? So those types of things. There's some safety controls which can be put in place. So is there a lifeguard on duty on the beach? Do you have your um, safety boat and is there a tow line? It's a whole list of things in there. You've also got the capability of your rowers. So in here, you might be looking at the skill level of your rowers. If your rowers are of a particularly high degree of skill, they, your assessment of risk would be different if they were, um, slight, were beginners. The experience in the surf, their experience offshore, um, you know, so these start to come in. Have they all done their swim and float test? Have they done their beach familiarization or beach orientation um, briefing? And then you've got other factors like the safety briefing, have you given them that? Has a crew captain been appointed? Has the equipment safety been checked? Have you completed entry membership, club entry forms or event entry forms? Done the signing out complete and is there a welfare system? So just a list of things in there. This will help you in your dynamic risk assessment, especially as there's a task later on in the course um, for you to conduct a dynamic risk assessment. So. What is an example of, the, of that task? And here's an example, similar example of the sheet that you'll be filling out as far as in the course is concerned. And you can see here, um, this one here has been pulled together. You know, it's got the date and time, the venue, the coach. Um, it's got the nature of the activity, the boats involved in it. So a little bit more of the float plan has started to come into this written um, dynamic risk assessment. We've got information around tide, etc. And then we've got the additional actions above and beyond the generic um, club risk assessment of the training location. And you can see here the being chosen here is, is some lifting, um, some lifting risks here, some weaver fish, uh, which is um, common in the UK, um, other users, boat users out on the out on the water and increase of the wind. So those were areas that this particular um, Jane Smith chose. OK. All right. So going to keep move, keep us moving on. 
And if we start now to look at boat checks, OK, so it's very easy when we first go out to go afloat. Everybody wants to get on the water. They've done it so many times. But I can guarantee you, you're always likely to forget something um, if you don't make it systematic. And so one of the things is potentially to um, each time you go out, ask the crew captain of each boat to confirm that the boat checks have taken place. So let's have a little look. The basic ones are bungs and, and um, hatch covers. Are they on? Have a quick look over the breakages on the boat itself. Make sure you've got your life jackets um, stowed onto the boat and your coxswain is wearing them. Um, have you got the tow line secure on the bows and is it reachable from inside the boat? And has, is there the has all the personal, has all the rowers got their personal kit on board? And, you know, suitable clothing is part of safety. Um, and, you know, that's one thing which is a bit of a challenge with um, young people tend not to feel the cold or as much as, as some of the older generations. So, again, one thing to keep on top of here. Depending on how far you go, there may be additional checks that you might have. So communications, personal, a bit more personal safety, navigation, survival bag. We're going to go into a little bit more detail further down. The types of boat checks that you undertake depend on the nature and exposure of your trip. Um, and what you might want to do as a coach is to come up with a laminate, a, a boat list check, um, laminate it and pop that onto the notice board so that it can be pulled off and, and used by, especially by your beginner crews. OK, let's take a look at different types of trips. So here we have uh, uh, an athlete um, launching his solo um, to go out to do some sprint um, racing. And you can see what what checks would he have done? And you can see here you've got um, the crew and the boat handlers. They're alert and they're facing the waves. You can see so really active, really involved in this. The bung here is closed. The boat's been checked for water. The easy release foot clips um, are in here. Um, the gates. Have, um, the gates have been closed and checked and the oars are across the boat. OK, there is a safety um, boat actually on the water. There is also a lifeguard here. Um, there's also been um, the sharp edges on the boat have been covered up. And also the beach itself, just in this area, has been walked to check for little bits of concrete or any particularly sharp things that might damage people's feet. Um, it's interesting that the, the particularly for this beach where there is the safety boat and the lifeguard and we've got very competent rowers doing it, there is the boat does not require to carry a life jacket. Um, but if you have a less confident swimmer, you as a coach may decide it would be a good thing for them to wear a buoyancy aid or, or some such. And sometimes if the wet weather is also the waves are pretty big or there's a chance of upending, you as a coach may require your athletes to wear helmets. So it's an example of um, example of the safety checks. You can see also that the athlete here has got his retractable fin, which will go into that box here um, once the boat is in the water. So that's a beach sprint. Now let's look at an endurance boat. Um, so this is an endurance boat, slightly warmer, slightly colder, sorry, conditions here. Um, and you can see what we have here. If I, we start at the back, the bungs are, and are closed. What you've also got is the light crew life jackets are securely fastened and within reach of the co coxswain. The coxswain themselves are wearing a life jacket and they're suitably dressed in warm waterproof outfits. They are also holding the VHF radio and the mobile phone inside its waterproof cover. The rudder and fin have been checked. Um, the easy release um, cogs are, are, have been checked and are in place here. The athletes themselves are wearing suitable footwear because I don't know whether you can see in this picture, but there are pebbles in this picture. This is not a sandy beach. OK, hatch covers have been checked. The tow line is on and it's snaking back and it can be reached by the bow person um, through thing. There is a boat identification on that as a requirement um, by maritime law. Um, the safety, the safety boat and the coast watch has been notified. Um, any less confident swimmers, they're wearing their personal flotation devices. The coach and or crew captain have signed in and out, so they've signed those 
and a float plan has been shared with a competent person. If they're going a bit further off, flares may well be positioned just behind the seat of the coxswain. So that's an example, a pictorial example of an endurance boat. So let's have a little look now at a tour boat. Um, so here we have a tour boat. This is um, a tour boat that's been going offshore, doing some quite exposed runs. And you can see again, let's start from the back. So you can see here they've got a set of wheels for coming ashore in a shelter where there's no assistance. They've also got a grab bag. And inside that grab bag, they've got survival bags to keep themselves warm. They've got spare tools. They've got a strobe if they get caught out um, at night and they want to try and be identified. They've got additional food, some additional water, cash um, or a credit card to get hold of a, a taxi or um, make their, buy some food if needed. First aid kit and a spare phone um, to call for the emergency services if, if the phones held on their persons are missing. Also, you can also see there's a fin block, which um, because of the doubles uh, um, would allow the um, boat to be placed on the rocks um, without damaging the fin. So what else have we got here? So on this athlete here, you can see the athletes wearing a waist life jacket. It's got a whistle, a 10 mil spanner and a personal locator beacon. So that's the satellite um, beacon, um, if for any reason, um, the emergency services would need to be called. You can see here also there is a compass here um, which can be visibly seen by the bow person. If we keep working up here, this small bag here which is attached to the to the boat has the mobile phone and the GPS uh, maps so they can identify navigation so they can identify where they are. VHF radio is actually on the, the rower just tucked down in the front of the all-in-one. Okay, now we can see up here, there's a nice collection of gubbins up here underneath an elastic, um, an elastic bungs. And there's extra clothing up there. There's a multi-tool which can be easily grabbed by the, by the rowers. There's flares in the orange flare box. Okay, you can see here the tow line, which is running down the side of the boat all the way. It can be actually picked up by the stroke person as well as the bow person. You can see the boat identification markings. There's a little bit of orange on the bows for better visibility. Um, so real range of safety stuff here. The, the safety boat um, and Coast Watch have been notified and a float plan have been shared. Also, if you're really, really clever, you can find the banana skin. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about um, personal flotation devices. There are a range of personal flotation devices and, and in the FISA rules, it says that the boats should have life jackets. So that it, what does a life jacket mean? We'll come on to that in a minute. Let's start at the very front. So what is a per buoyancy aid? So a buoyancy aid, um, very common, especially in sailing and stand up paddle boarding and water sports. It's a buoyancy aid of a 50 newtons. Now these buoyancy aids, they're for com competent swimmers. So they're people who know how to swim, who are doing water sports and their additional flotation um, where there's help close at hand so they can get back into the boat. So that often defined in that space and that is usually for people who are under 70 kilograms. So if you're above 70 kilograms, that, that you may need a, an additional more than 50 newtons worth of buoyancy. So there's a second type of buoyancy in general. There's a 100 Newton buoyancy, buoyancy aid. And again, these are designed primarily for non-swimmers to keep non-swimmers afloat in sheltered coastal waters um, where help is close at hand. So where there's a safety boat, uh, etc. Now, again, these are for less than 70 kilo persons. Um, but the key consideration to understand about the buoyancy aids is they are not designed to turn an unconscious wearer face up. So if for any reason um, you start to um, potentially, uh, an, your rower may slip into hypothermia and start to, to um, fall away from consciousness, this will not turn them over. And that's why the life jacket is specified. 
Um, and the life jackets for both the swimmers and non-swimmers is for more offshore and severe conditions um, than buoyancy aids. And they're designed to turn the swimmer, um, un an unconscious person, face up in five seconds. They can be manually um, or gas inflated. So it's a critical distinction between those. And it's really you as, a, as you're doing your dynamic risk assessments or you're working with your club committee to do the generic risk assessment. It's really important to be very clear on what type of personal flotation devices you require your athletes to have. Um, and so it all depends on the level of exposure and the level of um, safety cover that you are providing to your to your crews. Just wanted to show just on the side here there's um a really nice um compact um, life jacket here and you can see how high it is up on the chest very clear for rowers i suspect that that would be ideal for the touring for the touring situation where you want your athletes to wear their life jacket we've got an example here as well um and i prim don't primarily use these when i go touring where their waist um life jackets 150 newtons um, and these are worn around the waist the only thing you do need to watch out for on this all these particular is that you do need to practice putting them on and they're great if you're using these types of um, life jackets they're great to practice at least once a year um, and you can do the the swim and float test so and make it um, you know routine practice for your rowers so those are some examples of personal flotation devices that are available for water sports. OK, so now let's look a little bit at this example of some of the kit that rowers may take with them. And remember, a lot of this is if you're going on a tour, you're going to take more. If you're doing beach sprints, you're going to have much less. And the interesting thing is with the beach sprint is that you don't want lots of stuff in the boat. The more stuff you have in the boat and the more lines you have in the boat for beach sprint, the more chance of it getting caught and in the way and perhaps having um, a the rower getting caught up in those lines. So anyway, let's have a little look. Life jacket. What you've got here is that waist version I was talking about. Personal locator beacon. Again, these small little thing. We attach those on to those waist um, life jackets. Um, there's a waterproof bag for putting all the kit in. And again, it's got a waist bit here. So as you're getting into the boat, you've got it already on you. Neoprene booties to avoid being cut on, on the feet on sharp coral. An extra windproof jacket just in case you get caught out um, on the water and, and you have a delay out there to keep the wind off you. Um, mobile phone inside a waterproof bag so it can be used um, actually in quite big wet conditions. Um, some tools and a multi-tool and a 10 mil spanner small clips here with a bit of rope so you can make sure all your personal kit is connected to the boat and it doesn't get washed over as you come into landing or going out there's a little light stick here chemical light stick here very very helpful um, in close proximity again water bottle a snack and then what I really do suggest when people go touring is that they have a net bag. It means they can put all of this inside the net bag so that they can use both hands for launching and landing when they come in and off the shore. So that's an um, example of rowers kit. So let's look at what a cox might wear. And we've got an example, a picture here of, of a um, cox from Exmouth Rowing Club. He's, you can see he's wearing his life jacket here. He's also wearing a survival suit, which has some inbuilt buoyancy aid, buoyancy inside it in addition to that. Um, you can see here the VHF radio is on his chest, close at hand. Um, and I've talked about the survival suit. Neoprene booties, we can't see those, but they're definitely worth um, making sure to avoid cutting your feet. And then a small set of tools in the pockets just for little things that might go wrong on the boat. And then a waterproof bag for putting those tools, snacks and phone in if needed. Also, you can see here, um, Brian is, is holding a throw line. OK, so what might be in a coach's kit bag? OK, and here's just some of the items that you might put in a in a coach boat kit bag. They may be slightly different if you've got a coach bag for on the beach, but you've got a throw line here, first aid kit, GPS and compass or compass, 
some a knife tools and tape covering up um, holes etc you've got a kill cord if you're driving a, a motor engine motor launch survival bag or extra clothing if you need to pull someone out of the water or out of the rowing boat rescue tube if you need to throw to someone to bring them closer to the boat um, fire extinguisher boat hook spare paddle um, you've got potentially handles and ladder or sling for getting people onto the boat and if you do practice your man overboard you'll know and be familiar how to use that equipment. Binoculars, always helpful. Um, your means of communication, whether that's a marine radio, your mobile phone or flares. Life jackets, additional life jackets and a jacket to keep you or extra people warm. An anchor and line, three times the depth of the water that you'll be travelling over if you need to anchor up. Um, to stop yourself drifting offshore. Um, tow line and bridle. If you're towing um, a, as a rowing boat, a bridle is often really helpful to have off the back of the boat. Um, I mentioned flares. Flares, torch and flashlight and a pump, additional pump if you've got a rib. So those are just give you an example of some of the things in the coach boat kit bag. So we've talked a little bit before in the previous about methods for calling for help. And the critical bit here is that we want to have each whichever condition you're in there should be two forms of calling for help two methods of calling for help um, and again as you come in and you do your checks these are the things you want to be checking for so everybody would have a whistle mobile phones inside a waterproof case marine radio flare box ignore this this is just a strobe it's not really a means of calling for help but it's always worth having and a satellite personal locator beacon just worth just um, making sure that people are aware of the difference between marine radios and just little um, UHF radios, which are little walkie talkies. Um, marine radios are um, licensed and in most countries in the world now you need a license to operate a VHF marine radio. Anybody can call for help on a marine radio. So some some I do know of some clubs that don't have that that use them, but only use them as a means for calling for help. So therefore, they're not necessarily in breach of the law. But it's definitely worth you as a coach considering getting your marine um, radio, a marine radio license if you want to own your own VHF radio. OK. And of course, in doing that, you'll get received training. And you'll learn how to use um, how to correctly call a mayday or a pan pan, depending on what, what you how what, how you need to use those. So going to keep moving swiftly on the briefing. Why do we do it? Well, we do it so everyone knows what they're doing and what to do if there is a problem, if things go wrong. You never know. You're out with a bunch. Uh, you're out with a bunch. Your cruise, your coach, your coach boat breaks down. And the others do not spot that it's broken down and they continue with the session. At least if you've informed them what to do, if things go wrong, they can take action. You've empowered them to take action. Um, what would you include in that briefing? The route, the training work, any important hazards that they need to be aware of, the weather situation and if it's going to deteriorate during the outing. Um, brief them on requiring any extra kit, what the contingency plans are if they're separated, um, which shelters they would be potentially going into. Make sure that you have appointed a crew captain for the person to take responsibility and leadership in that boat and that they know who and how to call for help and they also know what the time of return is back to base. OK, so before you launch, make sure you brief them how you're going to launch and then undertake the final radio check just before you go on to the water. So signing out, signing out, out onto the water. So we talked about this before in, in, in one of the previous sessions. This could be as simple as a signing out sheet, which has the name of the boat, the number of people in the boat and where you're going and when you plan, plan to be back. So that could easily be a sheet at the club or a... Um, an online Google sheet. You may also have a, your club may have a responsible person on shore who is physically waiting for you on your return um, to guide the crew back in. So again, that's just a little bit more active and it's not reliant on somebody checking the signing in and signing out sheet. And then of course, 
the um, further ones that are starting to become more and more popular is phone apps where you log your float plan okay your route and where you're going and when you expect to be back and if you fail to post and downgrade your um, your um, trip off the app your appointed contact will be automatically alerted um, and there's grow, growing numbers of these and safe tracks is probably the the first original one which designed specifically for sailing different clubs have different systems different types of um, exposure or different types of, of row would require different types of signing in and signing out. This is just very good practice um, for everybody to do. So lastly, just before you go onto the water, brief people exactly about how you're going to carry the boat down and how you're going to launch. And, you know, it's always important because these boats, are, if you don't have enough people or you don't lift them or carry them well, there is a risk to um, for injury of the participants. So be really clear, encourage everyone to help out to, if you're going to carry the boat. Here, have you got any wheels or launching trolleys? Now we've got a nice picture here with some lovely orange wheels, a beautiful, nice, light aluminium launching trolley, nice fat wheels to go over the sand. Um, and you know, nice and simple so that it's not damaged by the salt. Um, you can have wheels. So you can see actually on this picture here, there is a set of um, tow wheels and they just hook in under the bottom of the boat, strapped over the top, um, and it allows the um, boat to be wheeled up and down relatively easily. Um, talked a little bit about a fin block and here you can see this is a fin block in action. See, it's just tucked in under the stern of the boat which mean, allows the fin to not be damaged by the weight of the boat it's being pushed into the, the sand or to the rocks. So that's moving the boat on land. Many hands make light work. So just to finalise, we've just now covered off the pre-launch tasks that um, would need to be taken place just before you put the boat on the water. We're now complete on that, so well done. So more information, well, as I said before, head into the coastal booklet on worldrowing.com. It's a great source of information in there. Inside the coaches toolkit, which you'll have access to if you're undertaking a world rowing course, you're, there's, there's templates for dynamic risk assessment, checklist and examples. Hey, well done on completing another session. If you like what you've heard and you want to tell us stories and share videos with us, pop them in the comments below. If you want to learn more about events in coastal rowing and what's going on in the community, head over to worldrowing.com. See you later. Take care.